around the sun the planets swing. And so do man's imaginings. In the dim and distant past he once called dream time, the sun was its most commanding mystery. Earthbound, early man watched its daily journey, wove stories around it, clothed it in the more familiar shapes he knew. It was a fierce warrior god, the glaring eye of a giant falcon, a golden ball rolled by a great beetle across the sky. To it, one raised stones and built temples, made sacrifice and prayed. As man once learned to sail like the birds upon the ocean of air, he now hopes to find new ways to share the power of the sun. In the mind of one man, Paul McCready, father of the first successful human-powered flights, a new aircraft has taken shape. A plane that flies not by the strength of a man or by common fuel, but by drawing its energy from nothing more than sunlight itself. Long a partner in man's technology, the sun has turned turbines, lit cities, powered mills and assembly lines. Now, in the spring of 1980, a strange aircraft is wheeled from a hangar in the Southern California Valley. In the cockpit is a 13-year-old boy, Marshall McCready, first test pilot in the program to develop a solar-driven plane. Briefly excused from school, he has been chosen for several reasons. He is barely 80 pounds, he is an experienced pilot, and his father is the inventor of the aircraft. Taking off on brief experimental flights, Marshall has found a super toy. Watched by a newcomer at the airfield in Shafter, California, Marshall prepares to ride again. With the bicycle escort, the penguin moves down the runway and takes off on what will be Marshall's last flight as senior pilot. Later, his father reveals that Janice Brown, a Bakersfield school teacher and experienced flyer, has taken over as the program's test pilot. Retired at 13, Marshall has suddenly become a consultant, like his father, sharing the expertise learned in his pioneering flights. Until the present, the Penguin has been used simply as a vehicle to test the aerodynamic efficiency of its design. Now, finally, its odd overhead panel receives the materials for which it was intended. Thousands of tiny rectangular photovoltaic units, each little larger than a razor blade. The solar cells by which the sun's light will be converted into energy and enable the plane to fly. The calculations are favorable. Only testing can prove them right. No longer simply a test pilot doing her job, Janice has become the star performer of the show. Concealing any nervousness, she mounts the bicycle seat in the cockpit as Morgan and McCready stand by. Tilting the solar panel directly into the sun, Janice at last releases its power to the propeller, and quickly the featherlight craft is airborne. Minutes later, a network newscaster announces the successful flight. Another milestone for solar energy, the flight of the Gossamer Penguin. This is Bob Dunn, Channel 2 News, Edwards Air Force Base. Not long afterward, back at Shafter, the experimental aircraft makes its last flight. The Penguin has served its purpose. A new plane is waiting on the drawing board.
called the Solar Challenger, it has returned to more conventional design. Gone are the canard and the cumbersome overhead panel. Solar cells will be placed on the stabilizer and the wing itself. Because the aircraft will be substantially heavier, 200 pounds against the Penguin's 50, the Challenger must also be stronger. Its main spar, capable of carrying the plane safely through turbulent conditions at altitudes up to 15,000 feet and more. Yet every ounce is a technological triumph. Without such strong and superlight materials as the Kevlar Aramid spar and Mylar sheathing, the Challenger would never fly. Upon the wings are laid the indispensable element, the 16,000 solar cells on loan from NASA for the experiment. Because their function requires the most direct angle to the sun, the top of the wing, unlike ordinary aircraft, must remain horizontal and flat, and only the underside is molded in the shape of a conventional airfoil. Directed by Boucher, a wing section is tested by exposure to the sun. Even the sun is not always dependable. Though the adjustable pitch propeller will rotate at a constant speed, delivering a maximum of two and three quarters horsepower, its capacity is sharply reduced when the sun is obscured by haze or cloud cover. One, 181, Sierra Charlie. 181, Sierra Charlie, To ease the transition, a second pilot has appeared. 28-year-old Stephen Ptacek, veteran of 4,700 hours flight time in almost anything that can be airborne, from hang gliders to commercial jets. And if you run out of altitude, just plan it right up on the runway and land next to it there, and we'll stop you and have a little bit of post flight, and then we'll see if we can't figure out anything different and do it again. Okay. At last, in early November, with all conditions favorable, the Solar Challenger takes off on its first protracted flight over the farmlands of the San Joaquin Valley. Not until the ebbing light brings curfew does the Challenger return to its hangar. Now the next step is possible. In spring, the dismantled plane is carefully crated and shipped to France. There, on or about June 21st, the longest day of the year, the Solar Challenger will meet its severest test, a five-hour high-altitude cross-channel flight from France to England. In a brief escape from flight preparation, McCready leads companions on a visit to Versailles, also a site of early aviation history. On its green lawn, the Montgolfier brothers, inventors of the hot air balloon, entertained the ill-fated Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette by sending up a balloon with a suspended cage containing a sheep, a rooster, and a duck, the first living creatures to ascend in a man-made craft to test survival in the upper air. Yet for Janus, the visit is marked by more poignant concerns. She has just learned that Stephen Patacek has been chosen to attempt the first long-distance solar flight. Assured of fair weather for one or two days only, the McCready team springs into action. As waiting reporters and cameramen from all over the world hurriedly appear, the Solar Challenger is rolled from the hangar for the last time.
But as the challenger is pulled to take off position and Patacek prepares for this final test, he and other members of the team are distracted by another worry. By common consent, for safety's sake, only one plane is cleared to film the flight. Yet two intruding aircraft, a light plane and a helicopter, already airborne outside the field's restricted airspace, await the Challenger's takeoff. While Patacek awaits a final signal from the tower, Janice, with helmet in hand, stands by as the backup pilot on the flight she had once hoped to make. And now the clearance comes. I better try to get off the end now for that southeast wind start. Any problem is contact the chase plane, okay? Okay. Solar Challenger, this is Pontois Tower. The creator himself is in the chase plane, ready to follow. You are clear for takeoff. Wind is 160 at the top. For Patacek, it is a moment of relief when at last the propeller turns and the Challenger starts down the runway at the beginning of the long journey, gaining speed as it rolls past McCready and the chase plane. With a kind of unhurried grace, the Challenger rises slowly flying past the assembled watchers below. Among them are the two earlier pilots, Janice Brown and young Marshall, wishing good luck to the flight they helped make possible. As the Challenger reaches a scattered cloud layer at 4,000 feet, McCready checks the course across Normandy, then due north to the coast of England. Okay, I'm trying to keep this plane away from you. Uh, it's not been easy, and let us know if there's anything that's not safe about it. It'll be a couple of minutes. Okay, Paul, it's not fine. But as Patacek nears the French coast, the stalking intruders close in. Abruptly buzzed by the light plane, the solar challenger shakes violently as it is caught in the turbulent wake. As McCready makes futile efforts at radio contact, the helicopter moves in with even more devastating effect, its prop wash pushing down the challenger and threatening to shatter it in midair. Desperately, Patacek seeks refuge from his pursuers, begins a dangerous game of hide-and-seek among the clouds. At last, through English and French air control, the marauders are ordered away. But one more threat awaits Patacek. As he begins the channel crossing, he is caught in the wake of a four-engine turboprop plane flying far below its assigned altitude. Too late, the radar controllers intervene. Battered and tossed, as if trapped in a washing machine, Patacek prepares to abort the flight and parachute to safety. Yet the Challenger survives, and Patacek flies on. Not long afterward, he sees below him the green fields of England. Just ahead lies the runway of the Manston Royal Air Base. As the Challenger slowly descends, the friendly voice of a British air controller begins to talk him in. Contact Manston approach 126, decimal 35. Surface wind 220, 200 knots.
after a five and a half hour, 200 mile flight at altitudes up to 11,500 feet, the Solar Challenger touches down on English soil. Again, there are the festivities, the celebratory acts of triumph, the champagne toast to pilot and flame, the quick recording of a moment in aviation history when man made his first international flight on the wings of sunlight. Well, the, I'd say the most exciting part was uh, this landing here. It's really windy for this airplane. So. Gathered around the Solar Challenger, each watcher feels himself witness to an event whose importance cannot yet be fully measured by some technical yardstick. But that it is a human triumph, there is no question. The main collaborator, of course, stayed 93 million miles away. It was close enough. Though the history of man is often one of needless waste or destructive battle over the planet's resources, McCready demonstrated that there may be more rational solutions to human needs. In itself, the Challenger's flight was a small event. Yet, out of small things, great consequences can sometimes grow. Who could have imagined the results when the apple fell on Isaac Newton's head?